Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I want to present part six of my series on the selected gross pathology of the cat. And we're going to talk about the nervous system as well as the organs of the special senses. Before I do, I want to thank all my friends and colleagues who over the years have provided me these great images which allow me to put these lectures together. A number of viruses have tropism for the developing brain in many species. In large animals, they're usually pestiviruses. Viruses like BVD, border disease virus, and hog cholera virus will attack the developing nervous system. In small animals like the dog and cat, it's parvoviruses. In the cat, particularly feline panleukopenia virus, which has a tropism for the cells of the developing cerebrum and cerebellum. In the vast majority of cases, the lesions are seen um, following infection later in gestation in which the cerebellum is the primary target. The virus attacks the mitotically active cells of the external germinal cell layer which are right underneath the meninges. These are cells that give rise to the Purkinje cells and the cells of the granular layer. You can see that with when you knock out those cells the cerebellum does not form well. It is markedly decreased both in volume and in organization. To a lesser extent, there's necrosis and loss of post-mitotic but immature Purkinje cells, as well as a vasculitis, which is induced by viral infection, which causes ischemia and resultant cavitation to the foliar white matter. This isn't something that just happens with a kitten in uterus. Remember that the cerebellum of the kitten develops up to two weeks after the animal is born. So postnatal infections in the very early uh, postnatal period can result in some cerebellar defects as well. Occasionally you'll see animals that are, uh, are affected much earlier in gestation. During that window, the virus can affect the developing mitotically active cells which form the cerebrum. Those are the ones that are clustered around the ventricles. And when you knock those out, then you get either severe hydrocephalus ex vacuo, or you may even see very severe defects such as poor encephaly and hydranencephaly. Another virus that is well known to target the central nervous system is the mutated feline coronavirus that is the, res that is the causative agent for feline infectious peritonitis. In the central nervous system, including the brain, the retina, and the spinal cord, the dry form of FIP is generally the rule. You'll see pyogranulomatous vasculitis in a number of areas, including the leptomeninges and the paracentric white matter around the fourth and lateral ventricles. Oftentimes what you'll see is there will be exudation of high protein exudate into the ventricles, much like we've seen before in pictures in the abdomen. And this is a great shot because you can see that the ventricles are markedly dilated, suggesting that there has been occlusion downstream, likely somewhere in the fourth ventricle around the aqueduct of Sylvius, which is the smallest part of the, uh, uh, of the tract that drains cerebrospinal fluid. And so when that gets blocked, you can see that everything is dilated upstream. And because you have leaky vessels, the ventricles are now filled with a high protein exudate, which assumes this sort of jello-like consistency when exposed to formalin. In addition to lesions in and around the ventricles and in the meninges, you can also see focal areas of encephalomyelitis and ophthalmitis. In the eye, the uvea, the retina, and the optic nerve sheath, all those areas which have a lot of prominent vessels are commonly affected. And this exudate may be produced within the eye as well. Vascular lesions are often surrounded by areas of necrosis. And I said many times before, FIP, every case 
looks different. Every case seems unique with its own unique blend of inflammatory cells. Some may be pyrogranulomatous, some may be lymphohistocytic, some may be lymphoplasmacytic. The one thing that unites all of them is that the lesions are always centered on vessels. Your morphologic diagnosis should start with the vasculitis and then the resulting lesion. Here this might represent a diffuse pyogranulomatous periventricular vasculitis with hydrocephalus containing high protein exudate. Always start with the vasculitis. If it's in the kidney, it's a pyogranulomatous or lymphoplasmacytic a renal vasculitis and nephritis. In grading situations, I don't look at the process or the cellular inflammation that someone has cited as much as did they understand that this is a vascular lesion first and foremost. Let's move on to a disease that we discussed in the last lecture on diseases of the skin, and we've touched on, or we'll touch on again, in the diseases of the respiratory system. And we're looking at a section from the rostral cerebrum. If you take a look, there are areas of malacia scattered through various areas of the white and gray matter. People refer to these as soap bubble lesions, and these are lesions that are seen with cerebral cryptococcosis. Morphologic diagnosis that most people apply to this is a focally extensive granulomatous encephalitis, or multifocal coalescent granulomatous encephalitis. And that is acceptable for testing purposes, but in truth, there's often very little inflammation associated with these particular agents. You may see some histiocytes in there and some gitter cells, but you won't see a lot of inflammation. I think that we choose granulomatous because that's what most of the dimorphic fungi do. But in the brain, it doesn't work all that well because this particular agent, Cryptococcus neoformans, um, produces two virulence factors that sort of hide it from the body's immune defenses. The first one is this thick mucopolysaccharide capsule, which it's coated with. If you run a mucin stain, these uh, agents will be a bright red because it stains the capsule, and that sort of insulates the antigens of the fungus from detection from the uh, immune system of the body. Second thing is that it has the ability to utilize catecholamines within the host and generate a melanin-like substance that the host recognizes as normal. And that's protective against the oxidative damage that the phagocytes are trying to do against it. As we said before, in cats and also in horses, many times this particular agent will get in through extension from a respiratory infection through the cribriform plate into the rostral areas of the cerebrum. Or it can come in hematogenously via a pulmonary infection. Cryptococcus neoformans affects mostly immunosuppressed animals and about 25% of AIDS patients and full-blown AIDS will have cryptococcal infections, large masses, which are known as cryptococcomas in the brain. Uh, cryptococcus neoformans variant gadii has the ability to affect immunocompetent animals. So just when you think about cryptococcus, cats and horses are two of the most important species to consider. Here's an absolutely great disease that you will see in the midsummer to fall, often in northern parts of the country. And you can see that we have a sort of an asymmetric cerebrum. Uh, one lobe, the right lobe, is hemorrhagic. It is somewhat shrunken. There is infarction and loss of gray and white matter. This lesion usually has an acute onset 
it's most often unilateral, so the animal will probably circle to one area. It may have a head tilt. All the neurologic signs will be referable to one area. The lesions usually pop up around the drainage of the, or at least the area of supply, excuse me, to of the middle cerebral artery. And here is the agent that has been isolated in a number of these, and you may recognize this as the maggot or the larva of cuterebra emasculator, which is a fly which uses uh, a wide range of hosts. When it sees a wound, it will lay its egg in the wound. The maggot will grow with inside the wound, sort of encapsulated. There's often a hole if it's in the skin to the uh, uh, to the outside and then when it reaches the time to pupate it will result in necrosis in the overlying skin the larva will fall on the ground and the uh, pupa will eventually mature with the life cycle starting again um, rabbits and rodents are common and occasionally you'll see them in feral cats the problem is that they may lay their eggs in the nasal or around the nasal passages of the cat and they can migrate up the cat's respiratory system to get within the cranial vault and there's a lot of questions still open it's been pretty well established that this is the cause of this um, and there is definitely ischemic damage almost always in the area of the middle cerebral artery nobody knows why that particular artery uh, it's thought that it might be a result in vasospasm or the larval migration the larva itself might uh, release some sort of toxin which causes uh, larval migration acutely you will see vasculitis thrombosis and hemorrhage and if you're really 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 lucky you may actually find the presence of the cuterebra maggot or you may see parts of it uh, if it has been entrapped and died, you might see part in association with granulomous inflammation. The chronic lesions after this vasospasm are what you would expect with um, ischemic damage to the brain. And you get marked loss of gray and white tissue, hydrocephalus, ex vacuole. The lesions may be one large lesion over the side of the cerebrum, or it might be multifocal areas of necrosis. Let's move on to another fungus. We've already talked about cryptococcus and cats are certainly predisposed to a number of dimorphic fungi. Depending on the area of the country you live, you may see animals with uh, nervous system infection due to blastomyces dermatitis, Histoplasma capsulatum, if you live on the west coast, the rare case of Coccidioides imminis may pop up. One, another fungus, which is not dimorphic, but exists in hyphal form within tissue, is the dermatiaceous fungus, fungi, resulting in a disease known as pheohyphomycosis. The difference about the dermatiaceous fungi is that it is pigmented, so the lesions are often brown or black in color. They produce a form of melanin, which may also act as a virulence factor. The dermatiaceous fungi, which cause pheohyphomycosis, are composed of more than a hundred different species. And in addition to lesions in the central nervous system and the retina, you may also see cutaneous and disseminate infections once again, it's a disease of cats and horses. Sure, you can see them in other species, but the majority of cases are cats and horses. That interesting combination come up again. Most of the time, feline infections are limited to the subcutaneous tissue and are thought to be the result of a penetrating wound. Certain species, such as Cladosporium bantianum and Xylohypha bantiana, these are all names and they've been renamed several times, are the ones that are most commonly isolated from 
nervous tissue as they appear to have a tropism for the central nervous system. When seen in the horse, cutaneous infections are generally the rule. One of the classic lesions that we don't see very much anymore in carnivores and certainly in cats is thiamine deficiency, which has a classic predilection for certain areas of the brain. The caudal colliculus, the periventricular nuclei, and the lateral geniculate nuclei are often affected, and you'll see hemorrhage and necrosis in these areas as a result of thiamine deficiency. Thiamine deficiency in feed may be the result of a thiaminase splitting enzyme in certain types of fish, which over the years have been added to uh, uh, carnivore feeds, especially mink and cats, and split thiamase within the feed. In addition, thiamine in carnivore feeds may be destroyed by heating them or by treating them with sulfates, which has been used over the years. Sulfur dioxide has been used to make meat appear fresh. The connection between these sites is that they are all part of the auditory system, and nerves run between the caudal colliculus, the periventricular nuclei, to terminate in the geniculate nuclei. So what affects back here will also ultimately affect way up here in the cerebrum. The first lesion that you see is sort of a vacuolation of the neurons and ultimately necrosis and hemorrhage. And it's thought that these are all vascular lesions. Remember that thiamine decarboxylate is a component of transketolase in the Krebs cycle. And so in deficiency of thiamine, you will see decreased levels of transketolase. And the component which immediately precedes that in the uh, uh, in the Krebs cycle is pyruvate. So affected animals may have elevated levels of pyruvate, which can be measured in the blood. Now it's been shown in studies in rats that these areas of necrosis are regionally high in transketolase, um, which never progresses to the, the next step in the Krebs cycle, but uh, that's probably not a very good uh, screening test for animals. Occasionally, you'll see necrosis of the middle lamina of the occipital and temporal cortex as well. You don't see this much anymore, as I said before, um, because so many animals and pets are on uh, a much higher quality feed that was fed than what was fed in the 40s and 50s. Um, it has been published recently as part of a forensic paper on a couple of cats. Um, that were neglected and starved and showed the lesions of thiamine deficiency because they hadn't been eating almost anything for a number of months. A very sad uh, publication in a recent forensic edition of veterinary pathology. Also remember that the lesion of thiamine deficiency is very different in ruminants than it is in carnivores. In ruminants, it tends to cause uh, laminar cerebral necrosis within the cortex, these, these linear areas of, necro of necrosis in the uh, submeningeal white, uh, sorry, submeningeal gray matter of the brain. Moving on, let's look at a classic lesion that you can see with a wide variety of insults to the brain and many of the brains that we have looked at today might have shown this and what I want you to see is a condition that is known as cerebellar coning and if you see this sort of reddish area at the back of the cerebellar vermis this is also cerebellum and what happens is when you have severe brain swelling of any type the brain's very soft and it tends to get pushed and mushed around. And severe swelling will push the cerebellum back and it will poke out through the foramen magnum. Okay, it'll push down top of the brainstem and it'll poke out. And this is the area that poked out through the, the foramen magnum and it has cut off the blood supply. And this area is 
very degenerate, if not necrotic. One of the problems that we see with cerebellar coning or protrusion of the vermis through cerebellum is that it depresses the medullary respiratory centers here. There are a number of things that cause edema in the brain. There are four basic categories, and this is going back to GenPath. You have ischemia, which results in cytotoxic swelling or cell swelling due to ischemia. You have vasogenic forms of cerebral edema, which res result from the breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. You have hypoosmolar uh, cerebral edema, which is seen in animals with salt poisoning, actually water poisoning. Um, and then finally, you have interstitial edema, which results from the increased pressure um, following hydrocephalus. So those are four forms of cerebral edema, but it doesn't really matter which one it is. They can all cause this lesion of cerebellar coning. There are two other places where the uh, brain will protrude under a or through a hole or under a, a bony part. If you have a lesion on one side of the brain, it can push the brain sideways so that the lateral cingulate gyrus here will go to the other side of the falx cerebri. The falx cerebri is that thin ridge of bone within the skull that separates the two uh, cerebral hemisphere. So something growing here is going to push this gyrus underneath that. And you can see that down the line when you take the top of the skull off, that there is a deformation, unilateral swelling, and damage to the lateral cingulate gyrus. The third one is the, uh, the protrusion of the parahippocampal gyri back here through the tentorium cerebellum, which is the ridge of bone that separates the cerebrum from the cerebellum. So that's going to go backwards under that bone as well, and you'll get like a little tail of the cerebrum when you take the skull off. So three classic displacements of the brain, but the one that we see the most, the one that's usually the most apparent, is this cerebellar coning. Okay, let's move on to neoplasms of the cerebral system in the cat. Uh, probably about 80% of what you see in tumors of the cat when you take off the cranium are going to be meningioma, and cats are probably the most common, commonly affected species. The most common location include the telocoroidea of the third ventral, ventricle, and the supratentorial meninges. Um, they're generally quite benign neoplasms, only about 2.5% or 3% are malignant. Um, and what they do is they grow within the leptomeninges underneath the dura facing outward. But there's only a tiny little bit of of room there so eventually they're going to hit the bony casing of the skull and they're going to continue to grow and then the non-advancing side is going to start growing downward and compressing the adjacent cerebrum unlike the dog they generally don't invade the underlying brain parenchyma and so the treatment of these is much better than in the dog because you can sort of scrape it off in the cat. As opposed to the many different types that we see in dogs, the vast majority here are histologically similar. They resemble the fibroblastic type in the dog. They often have a lot of cholesterol clefts and not a, a difficult diagnosis to make. Now, the other 20%, and I'm not going to get into any of the specific ones, but Basically, cats will have the same type as you would see in the dog. They're often difficult to diagnose if they are aggressive. Here's one in the piriform lobe, the, the, uh, the preferred spot for astrocytomas, uh, or at least a good spot for astrocytomas. And you can see that we don't really see uh, a nice demarcation between the neoplasm and the surrounding tissue because it's growing quickly. There are areas of hemorrhage and necrosis within it, and this is probably 
a high-grade glioma. Don't forget to go back and read the recent paper. There's been a number of them now um, from a, a brain tumor group for dogs and cats who've been working with the humans to simplify the uh, nomenclature and the criteria of dog and cat, especially dog uh, gliomas, and bring it more in line with, with what is seen in, seen in people. And the grading system has essentially boiled down to low and high grade oligos and low and high grade astrocytomas. So uh, Jay Kohler, Drew Miller are architects of that, and I would strongly encourage you to go and find that because it's got great information on uh, uh, on different immunos and how they work. And, and you'd be surprised. We've been using Oleg-1 here at the JPC thinking for a number of years that, oh, it's specific for oligocytes because they've called it Oleg-1. But uh, it is a marker of uh, both astrocytes and oligodendrocytes, which come from a, a similar stem cell. So there's some great information in the paper, and I strongly recommend it. Okay, this is sort of an interesting lesion, and as a matter of fact, we just saw another one uh, in, the, in a dog very recently, and this is a condition known as disseminated oligodendrogliomatosis. And it is essentially a, this is a spinal cord, um, and you can see it in dogs and cats, and essentially it is a big tumor which affects the, essentially the entire spinal cord. You can see this great picture from Ramesh Kovi. These are the sections that were taken of the spinal cord, and you can see that this growth of oligodendrocytes went all the way down the cord. Now, um, the nomenclature is sort of interesting. Ol oligodendrogliomatosis refers to a subdural proliferation of oligodendrocytes which do not infiltrate the cord. Once it infiltrates the cord, it becomes a neoplasm and probably fits into the anaplastic oligodendro glioma category, but just a, a wonderful lesion. Um, you may never see it in your entire career, but if you do, it's pretty spectacular. We just had one here. Let's look at a couple of eye things in cats. If you're very interested in cat eyes and dog eyes, I would refer you to a lecture that I did uh, last year on ocular pathology in uh, in domestic species where we cover all of the species and we go through all the tumors and and all the infectious agents it's probably about six hour lecture series there's also a wonderful lecture by dr ingeborg langor on the foundation's youtube channel which she presented in eastern europe last year in belgrade so both of those are fun and i'm just going to quickly cover a number of common entities that you will see. And this is a cat with a well demarcated whitish nodule within the eye. And this could be a number of things. The position from it, the uh, location. Um, I want to think about a uh, benign neoplasm, generally benign expansile neoplasm called an ciliary body tumor in cats because it is so well demarcated in the location. This one happened to be lymphoma, which may be one of the most common, if not the most common intraocular tumor, probably second most common intraocular tumor in cats. And then the other thing I would think about is cryptococcal infection. And you can see focal cryptococcal infections as well. The most common neoplasm of the cat's eye is the uh, melanomas that arise within the iris very slowly. This is diffuse irritable melanoma. And these neoplasms progress over many years to result in diffuse irritable thickening and ultimately are most often removed, uh, not because they metastasize, but because they cause glaucoma due to impingement on the drainage angle. They generally arise from the melanocytes on the anterior border of the iris. And 
will eventually replace irritable structures. They have a variable histologic appearance. Many of them are composed of giant melanocytes. Usually it is the smaller spindle component that we're worried about in terms of metastasis. Here is one that has progressed um, more significantly. Kently, the eye was never removed, but you can see that there's sort of an abnormal constriction of the pupil. This animal might have had glaucoma. So I said before, they, these tend not to metastasize. The one that does metastasize are the melanomas that are seen at the limbal border um, between the cornea and the sclera. They're on the outside of the eye, and those are the ones that uh, metastasize, and they metastasize widely, often to the liver. They'll kill the cat. Um, there are some very spectacular uh, or hepatic melanomas in the Wednesday slide conference in the last decade, both arising from uh, melanomas of the limbal sclera in the cat. As we said a number of times before in this particular lecture, uh, give a cat a little bit of any type of injury or inflammation, and it'll do its damnedest to make a big sarcoma out of it. And this is a lesion that was first diagnosed in the early 90s. It's been seen many times. It's well characterized in the cat. And this is known as a post-traumatic sarcoma. Injury to the eye, especially injury to the lens, will result in neoplastic transformation of the epithelium on the posterior side of the lens. And it's a, it's a progression. You can see a number of different uh, uh, mesenchymal tumors arise from this. Most of them are sort of disordered fibrosarcoma-like tumors, but you can see chondrosarcomas. There's even one or two lymphomas pop up following uh, injury in the eye. And so the cat gets hit in the eye, and then the eye, due to the damage, usually becomes physic and shrinks. And that's good. The cat can't see out of it. But then the eye starts to gradually enlarge with these tumors over the time. And the owner says, oh, it's a miracle. The cat's eye looks better. Well, actually, they are growing one of these uh, traumatic sarcomas. They don't tend to metastasize very much, but they do require enucleation. This particular image is a contribution by Dr. Dick DeBilzig and the great people up at uh, the Comparative Ophthalmology Laboratory at the uh, University of Wisconsin, uh, currently being run by Leandro Teixeira, and they publish wonderful information on Facebook uh, about uh, lesions of the eye and great images. So I strongly recommend that y'all go over there and take a look at their images. When I look at them, I thought I would learn all sorts of things, but now I, I'm sort of more confused than ever. I used to think I could tell a little bit about the eye from a gross picture, but uh, I'm still struggling with that. Okay, here's a couple of cloudy eyes in a cat with a case of anterior uveitis. Whenever you see something like this, you really have to come up with a differential diagnosis. It's difficult to diagnose anything like this grossly. Things that I would think about would be, uh, of course, feline infectious peritonitis, that vasculitis and anterior uveitis resulting in the leakage of a high protein exudate certainly could do it. I'm going to think a little bit about crypto because it's not always focal. Um, Another thing that I'm going to think about is a syndrome known as idiopathic lymphonodular uveitis. This is progressive lymphoplasmocytic inflammation in the uveal tract, often resulting in hyaline membranes along the back of the iris, um, and a wide variety of inflammatory changes and may result in occlusion of the drainage angle in severe cases. Sometimes it can be so thick that you uh, can confuse it with lymphoma. The cause of this is, is still not known. It's, uh, it's surmised that maybe previous infections with toxo may play a role. But uh, right now, the condition is still an idiopathic condition resulting in an anterior uveitis in affected cats. Here's a great picture. We talked about FIP and a great picture of the exudate um, within the posterior chamber of the eye, resulting in 
uh, this jelly-like uh, exudate, which you will see on a formalin fixation, much like what we saw in the ventricles. Absolutely fantastic picture. And here's a picture that I love, and it's a rare picture. And in cats with portosystemic shunting, they develop what are known as copper-colored irises. And nobody's ever been able to explain this one to me. I would like to know the pathogenesis. It occasionally happens. And I know there's a market out there for these cats with the, the rubiosis iridus look. Um, unfortunately, they don't last very long. Obviously, this one's been drooling a bit, so they're usually pretty sick by the time they get to this point. And we're going to finish up with a, uh, a fairly common problem still in young cats, especially those with chronic rhinitis, and these are nasopharyngeal, so people call them fibrovascular polyps, which will pop up within the nasal cavity or within the ear, such as we see here. They're often the result of chronic rhinitis or sinusitis. These are two that Dr. King got on the uh, same day, and they will start in the nasal cavity, and they will elongate, and they will come da down into the back of the throat, and the cat snorts and snuffles, and um, it could be a real problem, as you can imagine, having something this big. But luckily, they're very easily treated with surgery, so early diagnosis and removal and, and uh, uh, attention to any concomitant respiratory problems may um, stop them from forming. Sometimes they go up through the ear canal where they can damage the eardrum and the middle ear as well. They, they're usually histologically just very well vascularized stromal tissue covered with usually squamous or sometimes a pseudostratified squamous epithelium. They may be hemorrhagic, they may be secondarily infected, but they're very characteristically in the back part of the nasal cavity and then finding a way to make their presence known um, to the exterior world. Okay, well that covers the nervous system uh, and a couple of things on eyes. And as I said before, if you're really into eyes, this would not be very satisfactory, but I do recommend that you go over and you see the full series of lectures on ophthalmic pathology. Well, that brings uh, nervous system to a close. I hope that you enjoyed this lecture. Hope you're going to come back next time. We're going to talk about reproductive pathology of the cat. And with that, I'm going to wish you a great day and wonderful health. Thank you.